My name is Len Cabral. I'm a storyteller. I live in Rhode Island, and I'm here with, today with the Echo Project. And uh, I know that Jack has been doing some work with you all. I'm going to uh, share a, a, sh a short story here. I tell stories. Or, or I tell a lot of folk tales, and my, my folks are from the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa, and I tell a lot of folk tales from uh, they come from West Africa and the Caribbean and also the Cape Verde Islands, as well as uh, tales from this country here. But this is a story that, uh, this is basically a, a memoir it's a story, as you all have stories. We all have stories. And this is a story that happened to me around 1976. I was living in Providence, Rhode Island. I was living in an apartment across the street from a building where my brother was working. And every now and then we'd go out for lunch together. One day we went out for lunch. It was in August. It was a hot August day and I was driving. We had lunch. We were driving back to where I lived and where he worked. And as I was driving up the street, riding down the street on a bicycle that was way, way too small for him, was this guy who was huge. He was huge. He didn't have a shirt on. All he had on was muscles. He had muscles on top of muscles. He had muscles where most of us don't even have places. He was huge. He was so big he'd make King Kong apologize. That's how big he was. He's riding down the street. I said to my brother, Allie, look at the size of this guy. And as he rode by us, he blocked out the sun. We were in the shade. I said, wow. <laughs> I continued driving until we came to a parking lot. It was a, it was a community parking lot. I pulled into that parking lot and I looked and right there in the middle of the parking lot was a car. And its four doors were open. And there were people sitting in the car. And the people in the car, they just had their lunch. And I could tell they just had their lunch. Because everything they didn't eat was on the ground outside the car. There were potato chip bags, soda cans, McDonald's boxes, Dunkin' Donut boxes, banana peels, all this trash. I said, no way, no way. They're going to clean this mess up. I live here. They don't live here. They're going to clean this mess up. So I park the car. My brother and I, we get out of the car. We start walking across the parking lot, feeling like a couple of gladiators, you know? When all of a sudden I stop, because I notice from the corner of my eye, I notice that fellow with all the muscles. He rides that bike into the parking lot, gets off the bike, gives it to a little boy whose bike it was, and that fellow with all the muscles walks across the parking lot over to that car, and he sits down in the driver's seat. It's his car. Those are his friends. It's their trash. Right away, I stopped. I had to reevaluate the situation. I said to my brother, I said, hey, Allie, you know, uh, <laughs> it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't look that bad. I said, I can always clean it up myself. No problem. Come on, let's go. And I thought my brother agreed with me. As we walked across the street, we stood on the curb on the other side of the street. We stood there and we watched and we listened as all the doors of that car closed at once. Boom! And that fellow with all the muscles, he puts one hand on the steering wheel, drops his other arm out the window of the car. His arm is so long, it touches the ground. He kickstarts the car with a little nudge. His knuckles are dragging on the ground, sparks coming from his jewelry. 
He pulls out of the parking lot, out into the street. He starts to drive by us. I'm standing there like this. When all of a sudden I hear my brother's voice, my brother says, excuse me, excuse me. My heart goes, bing. Excuse me. The fellow driving the car looks at us, reaches back, pinches the rear tire of the car. My brother says, excuse me, can we have all that stuff over there? You know, the banana peels, the soda cans, McDonald's boxes, Dunkin' Donut boxes. Can we have all that stuff? The guy looks at us, looks at all that trash, looks back at us, reaches over, and he grabs the shift. I'm praying that he's going to put it in reverse and not park. He puts it in reverse. He releases the rear tire of the car. The car rolls back down the street. He turns it into that parking lot, right into the center of all that trash. He pinches the rear tire. He gets out of the car. He orders his friends out of the car. He points and they pick. He points and they pick. He points and they pick. They're as afraid of him as I am. They pick up all their trash, plus trash that had been there for six weeks. They put it in a big dumpster. They get back into the car. The doors are all closed. Vroom! He puts one hand on the steering wheel, drops his other arm out the window of the car. His arm is so long, it touches the ground. He kickstarts the car once again with a little nudge. His knuckles are dragging on the ground, sparks coming from his jewelry. His knuckles are dragging on the ground. He pulls out of the parking lot, out into the street. He starts to drive by us. I'm standing there like this. He looks at us and he goes, and he drives down the street. I go, my brother nudges me and says, Len, it's not what you say. It's how you say it. Tact. <laughs> and that's what we mean when you hear people say we must be tactful, we must be cool. There was no other way we could have gotten them to clean up that mess. I could have said, hey, you beast, clean up that mess. <laughs> but then I wouldn't be here today, would I? But because my brother said it that way, they realized we weren't threatening them. We just pointing something out to them in a humorous way, and they decided to do the right thing, which was indeed to pick up after themselves. And I guess that's why my mom always says, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. <laughs>